All right, guys, hope you enjoyed the little quiz I gave you yesterday trying to figure out what political party you most likely would fall into. Uh, but now we're going to actually get into this unit. Make sure you're looking at your notes with the fill in the blanks for this entire unit. Today we're going to be focusing specifically on the history of the political parties. Now, without further ado, let's get going on political parties. But first off, what kind of party are we talking about here? Like, I'm hearing the word political, and I'm hearing the word party, but more importantly, I'm hearing the word party. Well, political parties aren't exactly what it may appear on paper. It's not a big party with celebrations of yay government or birthday parties for congressmen or congresswomen to give each other political gifts. In all reality, these things can be anything but civilized. Um, as in, you might see people literally duke it out with boxing gloves or just break out in fights. Although that's not the a picture of our Congress, that's the one in Ukraine, but they have a government very similar to ours. And uh, it doesn't mean there's never been fights in Congress. There's actually been a few. More on that later. So if I had to ask you like, to explain to like a nine-year-old what a political party is, it's simply an organization of people who wish to influence and control government by ultimately getting their people that have like-minded views of them elected into office. So if you're a Democrat, you may not be the one who is actually in Washington, D.C., actually running Congress or something like that, but you want to help you get your guys elected so that way they can influence and control government. Same for Republicans and so forth. Um, and the whole point of a party is that you all share very similar ideas of what government should look like. It doesn't mean all of your ideas are the same. You might disagree, um, and you'll see that when we start talking about what these parties believe in. Uh, but in general, it's an organization that wants to influence and control government. Now today, specifically, we're going to be talking about the history of political parties. And now, like most things in civics, if I were to introduce a new concept, we usually start by talking about the Constitution, because that's where it seems everything is located for our government. Uh, does anybody, you know, speaking rhetorically, obviously, because I'm not in front of you, know where in the Constitution, like what article talks about political parties? Nowhere. It's nowhere to be found. None of the seven articles none of the first 10 amendments, not even in any of the 27 amendments. So you get the idea. This is something that is not in the Constitution and uh, the interpretations of what it looks like doesn't come from the Constitution. In fact, to put it even more perspective, our founding fathers did not like political parties. They saw them as destructive and a danger to liberty. But how can this be, Mr. Shones? Didn't most of our founding fathers actually have political parties? Correct. Thomas Jefferson, who in the previous slide actually was the one writing that Declaration of Independence, someone who didn't like political parties, actually ends up being in a political party. So what gives? Well, prior to the Constitution, there was no government, and thusly there was no need for political parties. So they didn't exist on the U.S. level. However, our founding fathers knew that they were ultimately inevitable. Inevitable is just a fancy word of saying that it's bound to happen because of the example of England. England was a monarchy, meaning they had a king, but they had political parties within their government, the Whigs and the Tories. So if you can have political parties under a king, where the king is the one in charge, you have an infinitely more chance of having political parties under a republic, which we are, where you elect people into office. And to put it in more perspective, just how much our political parties, our founding fathers, didn't like, but knew they were inevitable, it's all in Federalist Paper number 10. So if you remember the Federalist Papers, how they were 85 papers explaining what the founders of our government thought the government should look like they flat out said political parties are gonna happen but our government's designed to deal with them the best that we can i know it's not perfect and if you've seen how crazy political parties are today 
It's definitely not perfect, but it could be a whole lot worse. Back then, though, they didn't call them political parties, though. They called them factions, which is basically the exact same thing. There are your notes for what a political party is, and as well as the Founding Fathers were not a fan of them. So a brief history of what pol our political parties look like. If we didn't start our country with political parties, who created them? Which presidents had them? Where did the original parties go? Because neither of them involved the ones that we have today. Well, let's start with Washington. Washington was the only president to not have a political party. He made it flat out clear that he did not like them, and he thought they were dangerous for liberty, so he wasn't going to be part of one. And to be fair for George Washington, he really didn't need it. People were going to vote on him regardless of what political party he had chose, but he didn't. So, and I love this picture because it's like literally, here's George Washington saying, you had one job, not make political parties. Now look what you've done. Uh, if you see how crazy politics gets nowadays. That being said, though, Washington didn't do political parties, but that didn't stop the people in his cabinet, specifically Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. They create the first two political parties. The first political party was known as the Federalists. The same people, as in like they get their name from the people who wrote the Federalist Papers. Albeit, not everybody who wrote Federalist Papers is actually going to be a Federalist. These guys were pro-national government and wanted the government to have more power. How significant were they? They only have one president, and that's John Adams. And then the party will dissolve after repeated failures at the presidency. The second political party, though, Democratic Republicans, now they have a little bit more success. Thomas Jefferson is the one who started them, and you're going to see a Democratic Republican in office for Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and even Quincy Adams. So John Adams, who was the only Federalist president, his son wasn't even a Federalist, to put it in perspective. Now, I know that you might be thinking, is that where we get Democrats and Republicans? Like, do they just split in half? Now, not exactly. Um, half of this party will go its separate ways and eventually shape the Democrat Party that you know today. But the Republican Party is going to be a completely different animal because they form out of not liking slavery. But anywho, at least for the beginning, our first two political parties, they were the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. There are your notes on Washington being the only president not to have a political party, as well as what our first two political parties were, as well as who made them. Anywho, on to the next two political parties. So the Democratic Republicans split because of an Andrew Jackson election, which you'll learn about more next year, and the Federalist Party and their remaining people are going to create a party known as the Whigs. And you're going to see a period of time in the United States where it's kind of 50-50. One year you have like a Whig president, the next you might have a Democrat president and so forth. Now who are these Whigs? They were a party literally formed because they didn't like Andrew Jackson. In fact, their original name was the Anti-Andrew Jackson Party. Andrew Jackson had a lot to do with the United States government. There's a reason why the man's on the $20 bill. Uh, but anywho, these guys were pro-national government guys and wanted the government to have more power. Notable Whigs, albeit a lot of them had really unfortunate circumstances. William Henry Harrison was a Whig. He was only there for a month. John Tyler was a Whig. He served the remainder of his term. Zachary Taylor was a Whig, but he only got one year, and then Millard Fillmore finished the term. So, full of bad luck. The Democrats. Now, these guys were state government people at the time. Democrats are not state government people today. And Andrew Jackson's the first president for the Democrats. Are these the same Democrats as today? Absolutely, yes. But that being said, their values have changed incredibly. Back in Andrew Jackson's time, Democrats were the party for slavery. I don't think the Democrats are for slavery today, considering they were the party who elected the first African-American president. So you get the idea. It's the same party as in if you trace it back to the beginning, but the ideas and viewpoints have changed dramatically over the years. Now, notable Democrats until 1861, you'll see why I stopped there in a second. You got Jackson, you got Van Buren, you got Polk, you got Pierce, and you got Buchanan. There are your notes on Whigs and Democrats. Now, moving on, our next major political party, the Republicans. 
So at this point in 1861, a lot of people are growing tired of slavery, at least in the North. The South was perfectly fine with it. Uh, and then eventually our country is going to get to the point where we ultimately have a civil war. But prior to that, in the 50s, the Republican Party was known as the anti-slavery party. Their entire platform was like, we want to get rid of slavery. They were pro-national government people, but they were specifically against slavery. Now, are these the same Republicans you know today? Yes and no. It's the same party, but some of their beliefs have changed over the years. Now, they still believe slavery shouldn't exist, obviously, but other viewpoints we'll talk about more specifically later. Uh, in 1860, they were strong national government people to put in perspective. Today, they're strong state government people. It's as if the political party is actually flipped. Now, we'll get into the details of what the Republican Party believes later, but the Civil War changed a whole lot as far as what politics is going to look like in America for a long time. It's going to take the Democrats a long time for people to stop seeing them as the party that was pro-slavery. Uh, and the Republican Party, which was the party that got rid of slavery. And to put it in perspective, check a look at the presidents between Civil War and World War I. Every president on the left was a Republican, and every president on the right was a Democrat. Meaning, in theory, there was only three Democrat presidents during that time period compared to the multitude of Republican presidents, um, albeit... Andrew Johnson was the vice president of Lincoln, just so you're aware. Um, so that being said, it takes a long time for the Democrats to rebuild that image of no longer the party of slavery. But obviously, if you see how popular the party is today, they eventually did it. And that sets the stage of what our two major political parties are today. Our two major political parties are Republicans and Democrats, and this is where they come from. Democrats owe their origins to Andrew Jackson. Republicans owe their origins to Abraham Lincoln. There are your last notes for today on the Republican Party as well as which party had which president at the beginning.